you probably know what a derivative is. It's the tangent slope or the instantaneous rate of change. And you probably also know the definition of the derivative, which is defined using the limit of the secant slope. But why is it defined that way? Why can't we just take the limit of the central difference instead? Or for that matter, any other variance of the divided difference? Let's take a closer look at the last one. On the numerator, we have f of x plus 2h and f of x minus h. So in order to get the secant slope, we have to divide by 3h. Right now, the value of h is 1, but it can take on any number, even negatives. But once we take the limit as h goes to 0, this should give the correct value of the tangent slope. Let's take a look at the case right above. This time, we have plus 2h and plus h. So the two points are located on the same side of the central point. Just as before, h can take on any value. But once we take the limit as h goes to 0, this should give us the derivative. But out of these four, only one can be used as the definition of the derivative. Why can't we use the other three? Suppose our function f is differentiable at x, which by definition means this limit exists. Then, as we saw earlier, the limit of any other divided difference will also exist, and they will all be equal to the derivative. But even if any of these other limits exist, the function might not be differentiable. Let's take a look at the first point of failure. This function is practically differentiable at x, but it has a removable discontinuity. Let's try using one of these fake derivatives. Since both endpoints are tied to the value of h and not fixed at x, the limit actually exists, and it gives the value of the tangent slope. Since we only care about the limit of how h approaches 0, we don't actually care about when h actually equals 0. Let's compare this to the actual derivative. One of the endpoints is fixed at the removed value at x, so only one endpoint is free to move. And once we send h to 0, we get a vertical slope, which means the derivative is undefined. This shows exactly why we need continuity for the standard definition of the derivative to work. Now, let's slice the function so we create a jump discontinuity. Just as before, the derivative fails to exist. Let's try moving the function value at x to one side, say, the left side. This is now left differentiable, but the right-hand limit as h approaches 0 will still fail to exist. Let's try the scheme where left and right endpoints are on opposite sides. Due to the jump discontinuity, the function's left and right limits don't even approach the same value. So this version of the fake derivative doesn't exist. But let's see what happens when we use the same side scheme. The right-hand limit seems to approach a value for the slope. Let's create a separate secant line for the negative values of h. The left-hand limit also approaches the exact same slope. So this version of the fake derivative actually exists even when there's a jump discontinuity. Let's take a look at one more case. This function is self-similar with the scaling factor of 1 half. So each successive triangle is half as thick as the previous one. Due to the infinite oscillation, the left and right limits of the function don't even exist. So this one is pathologically non-continuous, unlike the removable and jump discontinuities where the left and right limits of the function at least existed. But because the scaling factor is exactly 1 half, the secant slope calculated using 2h and h will always stay 0. So the limit of this scheme approaches 0. Now let's try the plus 2h minus h scheme. This limit exists as well for practically the same reason. We've now seen several cases where a non-standard derivative exists, but the function is not differentiable. These failures were consistently tied to discontinuities. In fact, for the vast majority of these cases, this is the only way a function can fail to be differentiable, which is when the divided difference is non-symmetric. As for the symmetric central difference, that one can fail in a much more catastrophic way. We'll come back to that one later. Now, for the big theorem, a function f is differentiable at x if and only if the limit of the asymmetric divided difference exists, and f is also continuous at that point. So, if we have continuity, these asymmetric pseudo-derivatives are essentially the derivative. Now, to be a bit more formal on what a and b are, neither a nor b can be 0, as that would just be the regular derivative. Also, a cannot equal b, because that would make the two endpoints the same, and we can't take the slope of a single point. Lastly, 
A cannot equal negative B, as that is the symmetric derivative that we want to avoid for now. The forward proof is pretty trivial, since we get the continuity for free, and the rest is simply pre-calculus level limit manipulation. Backward, on the other hand, is several orders of magnitude more difficult. Let's start the forward proof. Instead of using general A and B, let's just prove it for this specific case for the sake of simplicity, because the exact same logic holds for the general case. To begin, we're given that our function is differentiable at x. We can split the derivative into two-thirds and one-third of itself. Now, we're gonna use the definition of the derivative to write each f prime as a limit. But notice how we decided to use 2h on the left side and negative h on the right side. For the left limit, we're gonna cancel 2 and pull the 3 inside the limit. On the right side, we can pull the negative up to the numerator and pull the 3 inside the limit. Lastly, we can combine the limits, which proves that any pseudo-derivative is equal to the true derivative if the derivative exists. Now, some of you may be wondering, why can't we simply use this equality to prove the same thing backwards? Well, the problem lies in this step. We can always combine two separate limits into one, but it's not always possible to split one existing limit into two. Let's take a look at an example where splitting a limit can lead to nonsense. This function clearly goes to zero as we take x to infinity. Now, I'm gonna give and take x squared, and then split the limit this way. That was an illegal move. I literally turned the limit of zero into infinity minus infinity. Essentially, the same thing happens when you try to turn the pseudo-derivative to the real derivative. The backwards proof is significantly more involved, so if you'd like to see the full rigor, it's in the description below for anyone interested. As for the symmetric derivative, it can fail even when the function is continuous. Let's start with the absolute value function. This function is non-differentiable at x. To be a little more specific, the left derivative is negative 1, and the right derivative is 1. If we try using an asymmetric pseudo-derivative with points on opposite sides, we get left and right pseudo-derivatives that are not quite as steep, but they are still not equal to each other. Now, let's take a look at the symmetric case. This time, the left and right imbalances perfectly cancel out, so this function is symmetrically differentiable. In general, if a function is left and right differentiable, then the symmetric derivative is simply the mean of the two. But the symmetric derivative can still exist even when the left and right derivatives don't. This time, we have a cusp at x. So the left and right derivatives both blow up to infinity. And any left and right asymmetric pseudo-derivative will blow up as well. But as for the symmetric case, the left and right behaviors are perfectly balanced. So the slope is always zero, and the limit is zero as well. Maybe we could take a look at one more case, a continuous function where the left and right derivatives don't even make sense to talk about. This function is so jagged that if you actually try taking the derivative or any asymmetric pseudo-derivative, it'll oscillate forever and never converge to a single slope. But for the symmetric case, the slope is always zero, so the limit will converge to zero. So the symmetric derivative can exist for such a pathological function precisely because it perfectly cancels out the left and right behaviors. So we looked at all sorts of pseudo-derivatives constructed from divided differences, and we found that most of them are almost the actual derivative. But the symmetric derivative is the only outlier. It can hide all sorts of mathematical monsters under the bed. But that very behavior of averaging the left and right side can actually be used to our benefit in a different context. Let's take a monstrous analytic function, which you probably shouldn't try taking a derivative by hand. The derivative of this function at 1 is roughly 0.1246, and this would be the exact value computed using Wolfram Mathematica. Anyway, this is the kind of function where you should approximate the derivative using numerical methods. So, we'll make a table of errors using three different finite differences for varying values of h. As we shrink h smaller and smaller one digit at a time, any non-symmetric finite difference scheme gets more accurate one digit at a time. On the other hand, the symmetric difference scheme gets better two digits at a time. This means its convergence has a quadratic order, 
And this fast convergence is precisely because we are averaging out the left and right sides. One of the hardest parts about studying higher mathematics is understanding what the heck an abstract definition actually entails. The derivative would be on the easiest end of spectrum to understand what it intuitively means. But when you think about actually writing down the formal definition, the one that holds up against every counterexample, it gives you a sense of how many hours this Frenchman had to spend refining the concept and finally land on a robust definition of the derivative.